So again, thank you for being here. I'd like to start with a little story, a scenario to set the frame for why we are here. Once upon a time, there was a farmer who had some pigs and this pig farmer fed his pigs swill. He lived near a port city, so this worked really well for him because he had lots of sources of food waste. Just so happened his pig farm was next to a, a big sheep farm and the sheep farm shipped used to other parts of the country pretty frequently every year. In another part of the country, there was a grass-based dairy farm and that dairy farm was next to, had pastures next to a sheep farm, you know, real nice picturesque part of the countryside. One day the pig farmer noticed that his pigs were walking funny. They looked to him like they were walking on their knees and he knew that didn't look good. They were getting around okay, but market day was coming up. So he figured he'd send some of the pigs, some, he'd send those pigs to market. In the other part of the country, the dairy farmer noticed that his cows were down in milk. And as they were coming in the barn, he noticed a couple of them were lagging behind and looked like they were drooling. My question for you in that scenario, who would be the first to request a veterinary examination of their animals? Would it be the sheep producer, one of the sheep producers? Would it be the dairy farmer? Would it be the pig farmer or someone else? So maybe some of you were hearing something in that scenario that reminded you of an outbreak in the United Kingdom that happened 20 years ago. It was just over 20 years ago that that outbreak came to an end. And in that situation, it was an abattoir worker who first had a veterinarian examine animals that had lost their toenails, lost their hooves. Um, and that was in an abattoir near London, which was quite a ways from any of the initially affected premises. So during this webinar, I'll be sharing information that may help you communicate better with producers about foreign animal disease or really any disease of livestock or poultry. And the purpose of the communication we'll be discussing is to promote earlier detection, faster reporting of signs that could be a foreign animal disease, with the end result being that we should be able to detect, diagnose, and respond to an actual foreign animal disease much faster. And by doing so, minimize the consequences, um, minimize the spread through the appropriate implementation of biosecurity. I'm Dr. Julie Smith, Research Associate Professor in the Department of Animal and Veterinary Sciences at the University of Vermont. And I lead the National Animal Disease Preparedness and Response Project, Secure Food Supply New England. The goal of this project is to bring together stakeholders to advance the preparedness of New England's animal agriculture sector to respond to a foreign animal disease in a way that will lead to the best possible outcome for affected individuals, their businesses, and communities. By attending this session, I hope you will come away with a better appreciation for why it is important to have conversations without produce, with producers about foreign animal diseases and biosecurity. How a communication model called IDEA can help you with that. A few talking points about four selected foreign animal diseases. How the acronym BUDDIES can help you can help you help producers know what signs to look for and bring to your attention or to the attention of a veterinarian. And what the Secure Food Supply New England project is doing to support FAD response preparedness and how you can be involved with that effort. So we're talking about communication and a few of you have indicated that you have talked with producers about foreign animal diseases. So my first question 
for folks, and we're going to have a poll that comes up. If you have not had conversations with producers about foreign animal disease, or maybe have not had those conversations with all of your clients, what are the barriers to doing that? Do any of the items on this list um, fit? a reason why you find it difficult to talk with producers about foreign animal diseases? While folks who haven't had those conversations are taking a look at the poll, if you have had conversations about foreign animal diseases, I'm curious what motivated you to do that? Was it because it was part of your job or you were asked a question about a specific disease or maybe you initiated, initiated a foreign animal disease investigation? All right, so it's important for us to have some idea about motivators and barriers, and how are we gonna start this conversation if we're gonna talk about foreign animal diseases with a producer? And we have to be pretty clear on, on our role. Why is it important for veterinarians to have these conversations? So we have to remember that if we're not having these conversations, producers probably aren't getting information about foreign animal diseases and may not know what signs to bring to our attention. If we want early detection, rapid response, that means we have to have people out there who know what to look for, that it's not just by chance that we're on a farm and, and we're called out for something that, oh, we recognize could be an issue. How do we prompt farmers to know what signs really need veterinary attention? Right? So if we can get this done, right, early detection, we'll be fostering rapid diagnosis, rapid response, let's do that. Recognition and reporting. So like I said, producers might not know what to look for. Um, maybe there's situations where we're not sure if we're looking at something that is potentially consistent with a foreign animal disease or we think it's consistent with, but we're not sure if we really should initiate a foreign animal disease investigation. If you're having that thought, the right thing to do is to call your state veterinarian's office or to call someone that you know has been identified for you to call as a foreign animal disease diagnostician. It could be a veterinary medical officer. It could be an area, veter area veterinarian in charge. Talk to them, share what you're seeing. They'll ask you some questions, walk you through it and decide what the best course of action is. The next step, if you're in a situation where a foreign animal disease has been diagnosed in your area, your site-specific knowledge can be really helpful to, to assist producers in implementing appropriate biocontainment and bioexclusion. To do any of this involves communication. It may be communication in a situation with high uncertainty, maybe with high emotion. That is the nature of risk and crisis communication. If you have some knowledge about how to do that, you have an excellent tool that you can put to use before, during, and after an animal disease emergency or any other kind of crisis. So I want to share with you a communication tool that you can put in your risk communication toolbox and it's called the IDEA model. This model was developed by risk and crisis communication experts at the University of Central Florida. And it is a great model for several reasons. It is um, a research and evidence-based model. So that's good, right? That it's a, a sound model. It is simple and it is easy to use. So that's helpful. It is effective at empowering people to make appropriate self-protective, to make I should say, it's effective at helping people make informed decisions that result in appropriate self-protective actions. And these actions will mitigate harm to things around them and, to, and save lives. So in our context, appropriate application of the model should lead to saving animal lives and human lives because we know how human mental health is tied in with the well-being of their animals. So let's look at this model a little closer. We're gonna start with I for internalization, which is in the top triangle of the graphic. 
So the I for internalization is talking about how do you make that emotional con that emotional connection with someone so that they attend to what you want to say, right? So how do you make the issue important to them? Why should they care? You have to explain the so what, the why should I care? How does this affect me and those I care about? That should be pretty easy to do when we're talking about foreign animal disease. Let's go next to the E in the bottom right corner for explanation. This is pretty self-explanatory. We need to explain what is happening. So if we didn't have our communication in advance, we're gonna be talking about what is happening and what, what is going on, like why is the response happening the way it is. If we're having this communication in advance, we can be sharing some information about signs to look for and why it's important to be on the alert and that sort of thing. Which should lead to the A in the bottom left corner for action giving the person clear instructions on what to do and not to do that will be in the best interest of their animal health and their business. I've left the central D for last, and that's the distribution channel. And for our purposes tonight, we're talking about you as the distribution channel. Sure, there's lots of other ways to communicate about foreign animal disease, and there are lots of resources available online. Every now and then there's an article in a trade magazine that probably lands on the producer's table. Good chance that producers are not accessing that information unless they have a reason to, unless they have had a communication, a conversation with someone that explains them why it was important for them to attend to that information. And the reality is producers want to get information about animal health and biosecurity from their, from their veterinarian. That's their preferred information source. They didn't check the box for magazine or state veterinarian or neighbor down the street. They selected their veterinarian as the trusted source. So you're the one who has to do the communication. So in keeping with the idea model, I want to share with you um, rationales that you can use in your conversation to explain why producers should think about foreign animal diseases at all, right? Why do they need to think about foreign animal disease at all? Those are things that happen somewhere else, right? They're far away, not gonna happen here. They're scary, I don't wanna think about it. Well. Let's have a conversation about why we might want to think about it. And the reality is diseases like other emergencies can strike suddenly with or without warning. Why do we have fire drills? Because we know there are fires and they can strike suddenly without warning. Why should we have some preparedness plans and maybe exercise those for animal disease emergencies? Because they can strike without warning. So. If disaster has struck and you don't have a plan and you are now faced with dealing with an emergency, is that a really good time to try to get brain cells working about, okay, what should I be doing to protect my farm? It's a whole lot easier for someone during an emergency to run with a plan they already have made. So having what I call that plan in the back pocket, you don't have to do it every day. But if you've thought about what you would do, on the day that if became when, you have a lot better chance of getting through it. You can work with a plan that you have come up with in the past. So we can help producers do the same thing. And then there's a the carrot, right? So for some producers somewhere in a foreign animal disease outbreak situation, the marketing of animal or animal products from their farm premises may depend on being able to get a permit to do that. And it might very well be that they need a biosecurity plan, either demonstrate they have a plan or have some part of it in place so they can get that permit. Hmm. That's why we have all of these secure food plants. So these have de been developed for the major commodities, milk, beef, pork, poultry, which includes eggs, broilers, and turkeys, 
and most recently the Secure Sheep and Wool Supply Plan. And these plans are focused on what's considered biosecurity for continuity of business. So the USDA disease response and USDA working with state veterinarians is interested, yes, in stopping the spread of disease, but they're also interested in not stopping all, um, all, associated, all affiliated livestock businesses. Like probably not every farm is affected even if there is a disease circulating in the country. So how do we make sure that those farms that are at low risk or have demonstrated through diagnostics that they don't have the disease, how do we let them continue business? If you haven't looked at these plans, I encourage you to do so. They have sections for producers, veterinarians, and others. Um, great resources explaining the biosecurity performance standards that may come into play. Where do I wanna go next? I wanna talk with you about just a few foreign animal diseases that I have chosen for example purposes. Um, and I put them up here and I'm gonna talk about them as examples that you could potentially use when talking with producers. Because if we just start, start in talking about foreign animal disease, that's kind of a vague concept. So if we can provide some specific examples, particularly examples that would make sense for the type of production of the person we're talking with, um, we might get a little further in explaining why it's important to have a certain level of preparedness in case we're faced with any of these types of diseases. So I'll give you the quick rationale of why I choose these. So highly pathogenic avian influenza. Um, this is one that it's classified as a foreign animal disease, but we have seen it in the, the United States and it comes back from time to time because these viruses are carried by wild birds. So the last major outbreak of HPAI in the US was 2014, 2015, and that was the biggest HPAI, HPAI outbreak the US has faced. Could happen again. We don't know when, where, how big, but it's something that our poultry producers and backyard poultry owners need to have awareness of. Second on my list, I have put rabbit hemorrhagic disease. So for livestock veterinarians, they probably don't think that this is a disease concern of theirs, but maybe small animal practitioners do. And we, this disease is fairly new in the world, but the newer variant of the virus, RHDV2, began circulating in the United States in, I believe, early 2020. And the particular strain is very virulent and it is killing not just domestic rabbits, but wild rabbits as well. So this disease has been circulating, spreading through Western states. Um, but I am glad to report that despite this virus and droughts and wildfires, there are still wild rabbits out West. So it's not all doom and gloom, um, but we need to be on the lookout for it. African swine fever was named African swine fever because that's where it was first found, but it is no longer contained on the continent of Africa and spent, I shouldn't say it spent, but it took a while to spread slowly through mainly wild boars in uh, Central and Eastern Europe, then it got to Russia and eventually got to China where it has been circulating quite quickly through their pork industry. China is the number one pork producer, pork producing country in the world to have roughly half of their pig production affected by this disease. It's, it's really severe. It has continued spreading through Southeast Asia and to other parts of the world. Most recently, of concern to us being detected on the island of Hispaniola in the Caribbean. So maybe you've heard the countries Haiti and the Dominican Republic in the news in the last couple months for other reasons. 
African swine fever is now there too. Only 800 miles from Miami, just 100 miles from Puerto Rico. Um, the swine industry in the US has been high alert about this disease for several years and is now on even higher alert. And um, there are reasons why we need to be concerned even in this part of the country where maybe we don't have um, all that intense of swine production going on. And last on the list, because you can't have a list of foreign animal diseases without it, is foot and mouth disease, um, which gets on the list because it is so highly contagious and can affect so many species. Being able to affect all of our livestock and wild stock with divided toes. So I have split up my infographics on these foreign animal diseases to answer three questions and lead you to more information. So the first question that I think is important for us to be able to answer about any foreign animal disease is whether or not it's a human health concern. So in the case of highly pathogenic avian influenza, it depends. It depends on the particular strain. And early in an outbreak, we might not know. So the animal and public health epidemiologists are going to be tracking disease very closely to see if it can spread to people. And if so, if it can spread person to person. In any event, it is not considered a food safety issue. The next question and probably question you would get from producers is how do I know, what does it look like? HPAI, like most severe respiratory viruses of poultry, may present with the first sign being dead birds. So sudden deaths, unexplained sudden deaths. Um, it's not pathognomonic by any means for HPAI, but it, it's an indicator that we should check into things, um, especially when a whole flock or multiple birds are affected. Keep in mind that for many um, backyard owners, a whole flock may not be very many birds. The next thing that you may be asked about or want to help people understand is how to prevent it. And the answer that you are going to hear over and over again is strict biosecurity. Strict biosecurity, we're going to talk a bit more about what is meant by controlling access over a line of separation. So we have a couple links for you in terms of where you can find more information, where you can direct others to find more information. So usually the fact sheet link is a USDA APHIS fact sheet. And the news sources are, are vary by the disease. And so in this case, um, I've selected a news, an industry news aggregator and wattpoultry.net or .com um, tracks highly pathogenic avian influenza around the world and actually is also tracking African spine fever because of its impact on animal protein markets. So next up, rabbit hemorrhagic disease, which fortunately is not a threat to human health, not a food safety concern. And we do have to remember that some rabbits are raised for human consumption. So it's, it's good that we can reassure people that it's not a food safety issue. What does it look like? Here again, we might be seeing as the first sign of a problem, a dead rabbit. Of, in this case, of a special concern is if people are identifying dead wild rabbits, okay? Um, in that case, people with domestic rabbits need to be on super high alert and using super strict biosecurity. So, this disease, like some others, is easy to transport by contamination. So if there are wild rabbits that got affected by virus, say outside of the house and the rabbits are kept inside the house, you really need to change your shoes or take your shoes, leave your outside shoes outside so you don't track that virus in to where the rabbits are. For rabbits that are housed outdoors, it's really important to do whatever is necessary to keep wild rabbits from accessing any areas around the domestic rabbits. So again, a couple links for you, a fact sheet and the news link 
is to a site called wildlifehealth.org, which I thought was is doing a really great job of tracking where this disease has been identified across the country um, and just helping keep track of, of where it is, but particularly on the wild side. Um, fortunately, this disease hasn't made it to our area yet, um, mostly found west of the Mississippi, but um, a couple states east of the Mississippi have found it. And those of you who work with folks with rabbits may be getting questions. I know some of the state veterinarians are already getting questions about access to a vaccine. There is a vaccine against this virus, but it is not licensed for use in the United States. So the only way to get emergency authorization to use it is with the approval of one's state veterinarian and it has to go through veterinary channels and be recorded um, record. There's a record keeping that goes with that. So be sure to refer any questions um, to your state veterinarian or pay attention to what information they're sending out on it. Next up, I'd like to talk with you briefly about African swine fever. Question number one, is it a human health concern? No, it is not a threat to human health and is not a food safety issue. This disease is also, also this virus can affect wild feral swine just as well as domestic swine. Um, and we do, we don't have huge numbers, but I have heard that there have been some feral swine in New England. Um, we and producers need to know what it looks like, okay? And I want you to broaden who you think of in terms of producers, because there are plenty of folks who have pigs who aren't, how would you say, they're not in the pork business commercially. I took this picture of these pigs on a dairy farm. How many dairy farms do you know that have a couple pigs in a pen? the back of the calf or heifer barn. I've been on plenty of farms where there's pigs and that's not their primary business. But anyone who has a pig, whether it's one they're raising for their own meat or it's their pet or whatever, they need to know what the signs of African swine fever are. So what does it look like? This disease is characterized by fever. It even got into the name, but that may present as not eating well, weakness, then there may be coughing, a sign that is more obvious that, whoa, I've never seen this before, is when they start getting red blotchy skin lesions, particularly around the ears and um, back of the neck kind of head region. Again, skin lesions aren't necessarily pathognomonic for this disease, but a good indicator that diagnostics need to be done. Once it is circulating in an area, the only thing that someone can do, because there is no vaccine yet, they're working on it, but there's no vaccine yet, there's no cure. The only thing people can do to try to prevent it is strict biosecurity. And I want you to put this information in the hands of everyone that you can who has pigs and refer them to the national pork board information. Um, yeah, they're gearing it for the swine industry, for, for pork producers all across the country, but you know, dairy farmers aren't in those channels. So we need to make sure that they're getting information about this disease. Okay, then there's foot and mouth disease. We know foot and mouth disease is not a human health threat. It's not a food safety issue, but what do people think when they hear foot and mouth disease, they think, oh my gosh, I, my kids are at risk because they know that kids can get hand, foot, and mouth disease. So these diseases to the general public sound really similar when in fact they're not. So be ready to have your messaging ready about that. Um, I expect everyone knows what it looks like in the species that are going to show signs, and some can be infected without showing very many signs. Um, but in cattle, we're probably going to see at some point signs related to vesicles in the mouth, 
around the coronary band of the feet and on the teats. Before those signs present, there may be fever. So how do we prevent it? Strict biosecurity. And in the case of foot and mouth disease, similar to rabbit hemorrhagic disease, tracking the disease around is a real problem because uh, here we have a disease that's spread in, the, in every secretion and excretion that comes out of the animal. And these can contaminate ground and dirt and dust that can blow to other places, can be picked up on the feet of people and wildlife that is going through the premises. So really easy for it to be spread indirectly. If you need, I've got a link to a fact sheet and I put the link to the secure milk supply um, information as a plug to check that out if you have not already. So before we go on to talking about what signs should be known by producers to report to a veterinarian, I wanna ask you what signs trigger you to make the call to the foreign animal disease diagnostician? What is it that you hear over the phone, Doc, I need you to look at, or when you get to the farm and you see something, what is it that you would see that would trigger you to call the foreign animal disease diagnostician? I think there might be a couple people on from New York and um, kudos to the New York veterinarian who called their foreign animal disease diagnostician this past week. And the producer brought signs to the veterinarian's attention they conducted a foreign animal disease um, investigation and found that some cattle had been infected with epizootic hemorrhagic disease, which is currently spreading in the deer population in New York. So be on the lookout. Next up, I'm going to share with you a mnemonic acronym, BUDDIES. And I have to give credit to the agri-security project that was conducted in Georgia it's not quite 20 years ago, 15 years ago, that um, incorporated buddies and a few other useful acronyms into their, their materials. Um, I really like buddies as a generic approach to explaining what signs are concerns that should be brought to the attention of a veterinarian. We're not trying to train producers to diagnose diseases. We don't even have to know what the disease is. We just have to know when to make the call that we should have a, a foreign animal disease investigation completed or at least talk to someone about whether that makes sense to do. So the first letter B is for blisters. And yeah, they're really vesicles, but hey, blisters makes it work in the acronym. So this is a link to all of the vesicular diseases. The U is one of our tricky ones. Um, in fact, two out of the three vowels are kind of tricky. So in order to get the exotic external parasites into the acronym, um, we stuck unusual in front of ticks or maggots. And, you know, you could think about it more generally that this is any unusual external parasite. Um, but we're probably pretty familiar with the Lyme tick, the black-legged tick. Um, so maybe everything else looks unusual. Really important to be, a, be able to identify or realize that, oh, maybe we should identify ticks that we don't recognize right away. And I've listed cattle fever tick, and maybe some of you are like, yeah, but that's just down in Texas. We don't need to worry about that. Well, let me just remind you that people do import cattle from Texas to this part of the country from time to time. And it just so happens that the cattle fever tick is getting more resistant to the insecticides that used to work on it really well. And there's certain wild ungulates in Texas, think game farm escapees, that are making the control of this tick more problematic. And then there's maggots, right? We love fly strike, um, but be on the lookout for screw worm. Right? It made it to the Florida Keys within, what was four years ago? Um, bad scene for the key deer. Good thing it was eradicated before hurricane season, right? Because that one can affect people as well as animals. 
and any kind of animal. I think it came into a small animal clinic in Florida. The Ds, fortunately, are straightforward in terms of connecting to a sign. Take them in whatever order you want, but one of the Ds is for deaths or downers, sudden unexplained deaths or an unusual number or cluster of non-ambulatory animals unable to get up and walk or walking on their knees. The other D is for diarrhea. Okay, that's pretty broad. There are lots of diseases that we have here that cause diarrheas, but when, when isn't that normal, right? When, when should we make a call? Maybe it's affecting a group, production group of animals that doesn't normally have scours or scours that normally should respond to a treatment aren't responding to treatment. Um, maybe there's been a disease going on, right? So we know there's some kind of disease, but maybe every now and then we should check that that is still the disease that we're faced with. There was an outbreak of two similar looking diseases in Japan and they were a little slow on detecting the foreign animal disease because they just thought they were dealing with what they were already dealing with. Going to the eye, we have another one of these broad, um, non-specific words, eye for illness, which just reminds us that foreign animal diseases often don't look that different from diseases that we have here. So we have to, you know, yeah, it's always way in the back of our mind. But if we're seeing an unusual number of sick animals or an unusual number of abortions, make sure diagnosis, diagnostics are being done. And um, that's just a best practice. Thing. E stands for the activity that will be affected in certain diseases. So eating abnormally may present as loss of appetite, could be the animal can't take food in and it's drooling, or it could be having difficulty swallowing. Difficulty swallowing, well, that's a sign of an endemic disease that we need to do diagnostics to see if we're dealing with rabies or not, right? From a public health perspective. And this brings us to the last letter S for staggering which is gonna help us remember to ask producers to report any neurological signs that they see. Staggering, spasms, seizures, head pressing, you know, whatever you want to describe as neurological signs that you want to have reported. Really important for people to know what these things look like. I was just listening to a report on the 2020 GOAT NOMS study, and they found that 80%, I can't remember if it was goats or, or farms are using official identification ear tags in the goats, which is part of the Scrapey eradication program. So that's great, right? So that's pretty good coverage, 80%. But less than 5% of those surveyed had any idea what Scrapey looked like. So it, it might be great that we think we're close to having it eradicated, but if we don't even know what it looks like, okay, yeah, there's slaughter surveillance, but Let's make sure people know what it looks like too. And then we have to think about what makes it easy to report signs, okay? Whether it's to you or someone else. And a lot of studies have been done looking at what leads producers to bring things to veterinary attention for a whole range of different diseases. And usually the reasons listed on the left um, come out. You know, they're, they're happy with the service they get from the vet. They think what they're seeing is important or they need to report it or it's easy to do that or they want to do what's best for their animals. They're concerned for their well-being. They're concerned for their own economic well-being. Okay, that works in ordinary times, but that's going to be a disincentive if they think, if they already think what they're looking at could be a foreign animal disease that could have trade implications that leads to the depopulation of their herd or flock that is a big, horrible mess. Take a breath. Most foreign animal disease investigations come back negative, but we do have to make sure that we make it easy. And what makes it easy is having a good relationship. So building a relationship of trust, 
making it easy. So for folks that aren't well connected to a veterinarian, is there an 800 number? Do they know who the state veterinarian is and what their role is? Make it easy for information to get where it needs to go. And then we have to think about how we make it a priority. So not just, if you see these signs, call me tomorrow. No, call me today. If, if I can just see a scenario where the herdsman in the dairy is really busy and he's on his way to get things set up because the hoof trimmer is coming and they're trimming you know, this one whole section of the barn. And as he's walking by the, the, this one pen of cows, he just catches out of the corner of his eyes that it looks like a couple of the cows are drooling, but he's in a hurry. So he's gonna go get things ready for the hoof trimmer. They process all these cows. And then he goes back and he checks those, the cows in the pen that he walked by earlier. And yep, sure enough, they're drooling. Better call the vet. So if you're already there, when you determine that foreign animal disease investigation needs done, you're gonna stay there. You're gonna contact the right person to get you in touch with the foreign animal disease diagnostician, have that conversation with them. Hey, what do you think? Do we need to investigate or not or whatever? You're going to be potentially there for a while. So you might be calling the office. Hey, tell those folks that we're gonna reschedule or you might be calling ahead your next call saying, hey, I'm delayed. I'll let you know when I can get there. Um, your anxiety levels might be going up for a number of reasons, but just remember, Dr. Joel Russo helps to remind me because I get anxious, that most foreign animal disease investigations are negative and it's important to keep doing them because a negative is a good thing. So it's not putting them out at all to come and do a foreign animal disease investigation. It is going to be inconvenient for maybe a little bit of your life and maybe a little bit of the producer's life. But guess what? If it's negative, everything goes on. And in the event that it is a positive, boy, if you were the first one and you caught it early, you should have people congratulating you, right? So it's a hard thing to do, but we, we need to make sure that we're getting the job done. I want to talk you through what happens next. And this is kind of a high level. And it's not everything, obviously, that would be going on in the response, but just picking on African swine fever um, because it is a disease that's close enough to us and novel enough that people just don't have any frame of reference, right, to think about what would happen. And some studies have suggested that by helping producers know what will come next, even if that what comes next is kind of bad, that it will help maintain trust. And by maintaining trust, we can maintain the likelihood of good compliance with what needs to be done in terms of biosecurity, biocontainment, bioexclusion to keep the disease from spreading further. So what would happen if African swine fever were confirmed in the United States? Most likely it would soon be followed by an extraordinary emergency declaration from the US Secretary of Agriculture, Tom Vilsack. It would also be followed quite quickly by a severe market impact as all international trade of pork products out of this country was shut down. The disease would be reported to the World Animal Health Organization, the OIE, which communicates with their members, our trade partners, and so they would know about this disease. Within the US, it would lead to a movement standstill for 72 hours. 72 hours, three days may seem like a long time, may not seem like a long time to you. For the majority of the swine industry that depends on just-in-time movement of animals from one production site to another, from finishing sites to slaughter, 72 hours is a long time. But it has to be done so that folks can come out swarm through the countryside to do surveillance and diagnostics so as quickly as possible we can figure out where the disease and where it may have spread. We want on farms for active observational surveillance to be con conducted so that any suspicious signs can be reported. And we want enhanced biosecurity to put in place. We'll talk about that in a minute. If there are suspicious signs, they need to be reported to a veterinarian, to the state animal health official needs to be in the system. Movement restrictions will then 
will change after the 72 hours. They may be smaller, they may get bigger, they may change over time. There is going to be a lot of change early in the outbreak and everyone needs to know to expect that. We experienced this ourselves with COVID-19. When we first learned it was found in the US, a lot of us were asking, okay, so where is it? Where is it? What should we do? Some people are saying wear masks, some aren't. Some are saying it's okay to travel, some aren't. So things are changing, the situation is changing, the recommendations are changing. Similar thing could happen in an animal disease outbreak and people need to expect that and we need to have um, good communication channels of where to get the latest instructions, the latest information that should be put into place. Let's talk about that in relation with enhanced biosecurity. So I'm not gonna ask you to answer this question, but we talked about the fact there are secure food supply plans that are intended for supporting continuity of business in the situation where there are some farms that hopefully aren't infected that could be close to farms that are infected and how do we keep the farms that aren't infected in business. On this slide and the next, we'll go through 12 points that are principles embedded in the National Poultry Improvement Plan. And then I'll share with you what the, the last two are. They actually have 14 principles in their plan. The first one here is line of separation. So when we're talking about line of separation in this context, it's important not to call it a clean and dirty line because we may not know which side is clean and which is dirty, or that may change depending on the scenario. It's important to think of it as the control point to animal facilities where whatever is outside is kept out and whatever is inside is kept in. So it may be requirement for certain um, uh, gear, footwear, coveralls, gloves, whatever, before entering a facility. Or it could be, you're gonna sit on the bench and take off what you brought in and you're gonna turn over here and put on what you're gonna wear in our facility. Or it could be, welcome, as you enter, you're going to head into this room where you can disrobe, go through the shower and then put on our clothes and enter the facility. There are different ways to control access at a line of separation. Perimeter buffer area is a step outside of that. So it's kind of saying, okay, so there's, there's gonna be controlled access to the animal facilities themselves, where, whether that's a pasture, a barn, or a run in somebody's backyard, but we also have to control access to the entire property, the entire farm premises, or maybe it's somebody's house lot, okay? How are they controlling access to and from their entire property? Are there multiple entry points? What are they gonna control and how? What types of um, vehicles and equipment are they going to allow to enter and exit? The third point, PPE, I hope you're translating in your head to personal protective equipment. So this is, as I was mentioning earlier, gloves, footwear, coveralls, needs to not only be available, but be convenient for the folks that need it to put it on and take it off without contaminating themselves or the environment around them. The fourth point is the point that I dread the most to talk about because it is so hard to control things that are free living and wild, whether they fly or um, run through very tiny spaces or fly around and, and bite people and, and animals. And yet, we expect our food manufacturing facilities to control these things. So maybe there's some way that we can apply at least some level of control to a livestock premise, premises. Equipment and vehicle sanitation. So this is, um, again, kind of a, a difficult area for New England farms, um, small farms in many parts of the country that contract different types of field operations. So maybe it's planting or fertilizing or harvesting or manure spreading where the equipment is going farm to farm. Well, it'd be great if we could convince people to clean this equipment on, 
on an ordinary basis to prevent the transfer of weed seeds, to prevent the transfer of diseases like Yoni's disease. And guess what? We better be cleaning and disinfecting equipment if there's a foreign animal disease around that can be spread through contaminated um, contamination on drive pathways, right? So where um, vehicle wheels can potentially spread disease from one place to another. The next two points, mortality disposal and manure or litter disposal have similarities that these are things that farms are dealing with every day, but we may have to have a stepped up plan or contingency plan when enhanced, enhanced biosecurity is in place to see to what extent we can handle things on the premises themselves. Are we prepared if needed to compost mortalities or the result of depopulation on the farm? Is that possible? Where, how? Some, some thought processes about that in advance can be really helpful. The next point, I like the wording from the NPIP, careful animal movement that incoming animals should come from clean sources with clean logistics, meaning understand the herd health history of where the animals are coming from and transfer them in a trailer that has been cleaned and disinfected. Feed and water protection go together in terms of the goal is to limit contamination. How could they potentially be contaminated? How do we limit that? If we're concerned about contamination of a water source, how do we get an alternate source? Feed protection is important. As I talked about with African swine fever, or should talk about with African swine fever, garbage feeding is a thing, right? So some states have licensed garbage feeders that allow treated food waste to be fed to pigs. Really important for that heat treatment to be done properly to prevent the spread of a disease like African swine fever. So you might have a conversation with people who are doing that to see if they could stop doing that. The next point, observation and reporting is, is straightforward and we've talked about what are the signs that you should arm producers with to know and report. The last point here, personnel training is actually really important and really hard, right? And yet so many programs now require recording of training, whether it's for welfare certification or organic certification. Um, in this case, biosecurity training certification, well, documentation of it is really important. So now what are the bookends that I didn't put on the slides? So at the front end, it's identifying the point person on the farm who's gonna be responsible for the biosecurity plan and carrying it out. In some cases, they might be called the biosecurity coordinator, the biosecurity manager, or the herdsman, or the owner. But they are the person who's going to be the point of contact about biosecurity. Maybe those decisions are made with a group of owners of the farm or made in consultation with a veterinarian. I hope in consultation with the veterinarian. But there's somebody on the farm who is the point person for how that plan is going to roll out. And on the other end is monitoring and compliance with the program, auditing. So making sure that what is in the plan is being done as well as it can be. So we're almost at the end of time. So I just want to take a few minutes to talk about what is going on with the Secure Food Supply New England Project and how you can get involved. So we've got a couple main objectives of the project um, that are oriented around the two items here, response planning and producer preparedness. Response planning is working with uh, state regulatory folks and other stakeholders as we update and extend um, the previous secure milk supply plans. Um, part of that effort is actually interviewing and surveying veterinarians and producers so if you get an invitation or a producer you work with gets an invitation, please, please say yes, encourage folks to respond. Um, we need input to make sure that where we're going with plans is something that's gonna work. If it's um, the best plans are those that have buy-in from all sides. And we're also working on a specific element of producer preparedness where we're developing a web app to help with mapping the farm 
to really help identify where the access control points are at the periphery and the line of separation access points to animal facilities and some other aspects that would be really important for an emergency biosecurity plan. Again, this is a place where we expect veterinarians will be working with producers. So I would love to have some veterinarians raise their hand, put their name in the chat or email me to say, hey, yeah, I would love to help develop the app and pilot it with, with a couple clients. Thanks for being here. Thanks for your attention. Um, and I thank you for your role in communicating about foreign animal diseases. This is a really important role that you have as a veterinarian.